you, Trey. <clears throat> Maybe we can put the, uh, okay, it's back up there. So for folks that are watching on the web, you can send your questions to that email address. As Elise said, they won't be live, but the NHGRI will attempt to respond to your, to your comments. So just to, to get things started, uh, first of all, thanks to uh, the workshop or, or breakout organizers for their very nice summaries of I was jumping from room to room. And there, there were unique aspects discussed in each room, I guarantee you, <laughs> even though you weren't, you weren't able to be in two places at once with quantum. So I think what I'd like to do is to have folks, because you couldn't be in all rooms at once, uh, if you have specific questions for the panel members, we can, we can start with those about what, maybe elaborating on what was thrown out there is a question over here from Carol. Yeah, please remember to announce yourself. Yeah, Carol Bolt, Jackson Lab. So Ross, I, uh, you talked um, about this comprehensive phenotyping, but was this meant to be molecular phenotyping, cellular phenotyping, and organismal phenotyping? Um, what, what was the scope and scale of, of the comprehensiveness of that? Yeah, that, 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 that's the uh, uh, constant question, the enduring question, right? Uh, and the pilot project, I saw that. My, that resonated with me because it gives an opportunity to explore all those levels in a, in a reasonably focused way. And so we can, uh, I, I mean, I've, uh, I'm sure there, <laughs> So it, for almost all of the, the assays that people commonly do, there's pushback from reviewers and, and other people saying this is a meaningless assay or, or, or whatever. And it would be really nice to have uh, uh, multiple levels of uh, information. I mean, if, if the, the gain-of-function assays really are mostly uh, uh, false positives, which I don't think is true, but, but there are people who say that, it should come out in the data, right? So we could learn... Where sh where's the best uh, uh, in investment? And, and, uh, and, and th there, there are lots of informative model organisms, but it's, you can't do all of them. Maybe we, it will come out that, well, actually, zebrafish is better than, than mouse for, for certain things, or Sionis might be the, Siona might be the best of all. I don't, you know. But it was, it was to give us that opportunity to make data-driven decisions rather than working from their history or prejudices. So, so and was there then discussion about how I think other people have raised this as well. So if you have comprehensive molecular phenotyping, how well does that translate to cellular phenotype? And how well does your comprehensive cellular phenotyping translate to organismal phenotype? I mean, it's not just doing the comprehensive phenotyping. It's understanding what the phenotype at one level can tell you about the next level of abstraction, right? So, yeah, I think that's part of it. That's, and that's a very strong point. Thank you for making it. Hey, we have other questions. Uh, junior investigators, particularly, your brains are quite active. <laughs> Do you have any questions that we we can start with? Okay, I'll I'll throw one out. I was intrigued by this idea of a model of the one percent or whatever percent. This fun code mm -hmm. sounds very much like the pilot project for it was for, modeled on that for encode. But so what? What's the is sort of a bake off of? There are lots of uh, uh, multiplex assays, and so maybe they don't all report the same thing as the idea to 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 have a, a whatever assay you you think is going to be effective on a certain number of cell types and a certain number of genes. Or what can you describe yeah. a bit more how okay. that might work? Well, 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 one one distinction that that I should emphasize, and and I would invite other members of the uh, workshop to chime in on this. Uh, the, the, the pilot project was to, to give us some data to, to help us understand how to go forward on some of the most difficult and challenging issues, like for regulation. Now, that doesn't, we, we weren't saying that we should have a pilot project for all the uh, characterizations, right? And so, so there are some, you know, there are existing methodologies for, for doing a, a, a very deep, doing, uh, 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 if you will, saturation uh, uh, mutagenesis in assays, you know, for uh, various uh, uh, protein functions, and maybe, you know, th those would be, they're already comprehensive, right? So, so it, kind of, it depends on what the question is. 
right? Am I not, am I not, is this helpful? Well, I, I got the impression there was a certain percentage of the genome that was going to be interrogated, different, different degrees of yeah. difficulty, for example, yeah, right. regulatory elements, coding, variants, uh, transposons, whatever it is. Uh -huh. So if I, if yeah. I can add a little bit <laughs> Thank to you. that point, um, I think the, uh, we recognize phenotyping is very challenging and there's no central standard way to do phenotyping. So part of this pilot project is designed to, to uh, explore the possibilities or ways to phenotype. And we talk about phenotyping using imaging mm -hmm. in addition to phenotyping using molecular data such as RNA-seq, uh, plus phenotyping using uh, to, to ex capture chemical information in the cells. Uh, I, I think the, the, the criteria for phenotyping is quantifiable, reproducible, and informative. And I think uh, through this pilot project, uh, naturally uh, some phenotypic assay will emerge as scalable to the whole genome and uh, uh, easy, easy to do uh, in production mode. So, so that what naturally leads to a, um, I guess, 10-year, 20-year project. Question from uh, John. Um, I think it's worth just uh, reminding people briefly what the ENCODE pilot project was. So we're now dial back the, uh, the time capsule to <coughs> 2003. Um, and so the pilot project was focusing on 1% of the human genome, which at that time seemed insurmountably large. Uh, and it was divided, that 1% was divided into sort of the human chosen, you know, here, here's a bunch of loci that we, we think we understand a lot about. And then um, I think it was Phil Green that came up with a stratification scheme for another set of randomly, was sort of a stratified random sample of the rest of the genome. And then a whole bunch of assays were thrown at, uh, at, at this 1% um, in order to decide, uh, well, first of all, to understand the characteristics uh, of, of the assays um, and, and their performance in preparation for, uh, for scaling up. Uh, and, and I think it, it, one learned a, a tremendous amount of, uh, out of that. One thing to, to, to comment on here is that, I mean, phenotyping has been brought up. Bing was just, you know, mentioning that there's a lot of different ways to, to solve phenotypes at a cellular level. I mean, to some degree, if we can't solve cellular phenotypes, we're not going to be able to solve organismal phenotypes. Um, but I think the other aspect of focusing on a small amount of the human genome is it allows one to take the first steps to understand combinatorics uh, in a really defined way. So, for example, in regulation, Probably most regulatory elements don't work by themselves. They're going to work in some kind of combination, other things. Just understand the rules that would need to be addressed in order to scale up to the rest of the genome. Sean. Uh, Chuan He from Chicago. I thought uh, in the room, the discussion, the, the scope of the pilot could be a percent, a few percent of the genome, uh, exactly what uh, John just described. Or could also be the functions of a selected group of proteins, for instance, for NHGRI could be DNRA binding proteins um, to thoroughly characterize their function, uh, look at the, their, their effect on transcription chromatin state, and then their cellular localization, uh, plus their biochemical activity. Barbara. Uh, Barbara Wool, Caltech. Uh, just following on the last two points, one of the lessons we learned from that ENCODE pilot, if I recall it correctly, is that after debating whether the pilot should include any subgroup of non-contiguous genes that were thought to be linked in a regulatory way, the decision was, no, 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 we're not going to take that on now. And one of the greatest frustrations of learning from the pilot is that one of the main things that people wanted to learn from the pilot is could you pull out coherent regulatory elements and networks. So in choosing the pilot, deciding which criteria to appeal to, and nobody's crystal ball is perfect, but that one probably definitely was a gaffe and we should avoid. Over here. So, so I think a, a really interesting challenge here would be, rather than saying we've pre-selected a 1% of the genome that we want to functionalize, would be to ask actually how much of genome regulation do we need to understand to interpret a particular phenotype? 
Um, for instance, um, if we look at the erythropoietic uh, lineage differentiation process, uh, John Dick and others have made significant contributions to understand what are the transcription factors that are involved, but how they precisely regu regulate the cascade and what are the stochastic element of differentiation into, say, uh, the, the lymphoid versus the myeloid lineage is, is still not completely understood. You know, there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be done. So I think that creating a context that is actually specific and may not be seen to uh, co conflict or contrast to what other institutes are doing may be actually really critical in determining what is the fraction of the human genome and epigenome and maybe proteome that we need to actually study precisely in order to understand that, that set of that, effects. That's very interesting. Is, is there a danger that that could be something unique to that pathway or that? I think, I think this is just a template. So first of all, we could select two or three of these problems um, as orthogonal as possible. Certainly some allocated with development and developmental phenotype are the ones that are most likely to be addressed using genome regulation only. Other, you know, if you look at metabolism, you're certainly going to have to need at least uh, some additional metabolomic context and signal transduction context. But the question for me that is more interesting is simply to ask what fraction of the genome do we need to actually understand and interpret before we can actually, in a, in a relatively definitive way, address this, this, this phenotype. Okay. So that actually raises, we can move on a little bit here, uh, uh, the discussion that would happened in the breakout five about what sort of systems could be deployed for this, right? So you're going to use K562 cells or HeLa cells. What, what, how will you actually get at, because the regulation doesn't happen in, in, in your generic cell line, it's, it's specific to a, potentially a few cells in, in an organ or a tissue. So how about the, the question of uh, the systems, systems that are going to be used for these kinds? They have to be, think about the, the scale here and why NHGRI should, should do this versus another institute with a more organ focus, right, if you're, you're thinking about a particular pathway in a particular organ. Any thoughts about, about that? Right? I mean, there is a practicality of using cells in a dish for high throughput, but on the other hand, is it a real context that, that, you know, you can measure something, but is that something actually that something that's important for the disease state? Oh, I'm missing. Oh, Vive. I, I just want to challenge a little bit the point of view that upfront says that, oh, you know, we should go for something convenient. Like, you know, we need to do it at scale, so we will need to use a cell line naturally, and so on. I think we have to move beyond that. Techniques have advanced a lot in the last decade, and they open up the possibility of going into more and more challenging models. And it would be a, it would be a great shame if we didn't challenge ourselves over the next decade to transition out into those models whenever possible. Can you give an example that people so can wrap their head around? I, I think there are now possibilities to go out of cell lines and into primary cells. There is much more ability to obtain primary cells from, um, from individuals, to derive them in culture in ways that are more authentic to their identity. It's true that there are legacy cell lines that we've studied for many, you know, for many decades as a community, but, but I don't think we should feel beholden to them anymore. I found that because I agree really very strongly with what I just said, and it is even beyond the cell autonomous type of system, there are now in vitro models that allow you to build entire tissues with full uh, perfusion by the endothelial system uh, and so even connect the disparate systems together in a way that is much more physiologically relevant, but also much more amenable to be able to perform experiment and assays in high throughput. And in addition, you're going to have the ability, increasing ability, uh, to really try to understand what models are good for doing what. Because one of the things that I'm really worried about is that we heard a lot of concerns. People say, oh, cell lines are useless, or, you know, or organoids may be the answer. We actually don't have a truly quantitative methodology to, 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 to state, to make such statement, and I think each one of those statements is completely relevant in a particular context. For instance, cell line may be incredibly good to model one thing, organoids may be good at modeling another thing, and, not, and so I think what one challenge for the community here is to figure out what are models good for. Yeah, Trey. Hello? Yeah, so this, this harkens back to one of the discussion points that I thought was really well taken in, in um, breakout six, which was the possibility that, that as we design these big data sets, they're stacked not just omically in terms of different layers 
but also there's an opportunity to stack them across different platforms, cell lines, primary tissue, organoids, whatever the debate happens, happens to be. And there's two ways to stack it. You can do it all in one monolithic project, or perhaps more realistically, you can make sure it integrates as different projects move forward. You know, Joe, I think you made the point that you know, GTEx is, is a great resource, but then resources like that have the risk that they're sort of self-contained and it's hard to expand upon them or that raises the question, how would you come back later and add other platforms and, and uh, you know, context to those data? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Thank you. Um, sorry, Michael Zodi in New York Genome Center. Um, one of the things to follow up on what Trey was saying, and I don't know if this is what Ross was getting at with the 1%, but I think it might be useful to take a small number of variants where we have some prior expectation that these are gonna have a molecular phenotype and look at them across a wide array of systems, different kinds of cellular systems, different kinds of model organisms, different primary cells, and ask the question of how broadly do we have to look to find a measurable molecular phenotype and how many of these different systems are gonna be strongly correlated with each other that say if you look in this cell type you don't need to look in this model organism because they're always going to tell you the same thing. Because one of the questions that was raised in our session is from the perspective of human genetics, I have a variant. I want to know if it does something at the molecular level. Where do I need to look to get that answer? And in 10 years, we may not be able to, that's a huge data set across every variant we could have, right? But we could, we could build the framework of how do you ask that question and what kinds of assays are most useful and which ones are most redundant. Jay pointed out, I'm pointing at Jay, on, on the, in his vision talk that this is achievable. You could make, you could screen, one goal out there is to screen. I mean, there are assays that can scale to address variant activity, at least at a molecular, close cis, you know, kind of, Thing. So what, what's the limitation in starting that now? I heard that we're going to do 1%, and I also heard that we're going to do everything, every variant. I mean, so where, where's the reality check? And are, the, are, they, are they, is there, maybe, maybe Jay, you can. I, I think you could do both, you could do both right? I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's a motivation, I think, Mike's point is a good one, um, to, or even, you know, looking into 1%, deeply, right, whether that's deeply in terms of the number of assays applied or in terms of the number of contexts that you're exploring to try and learn generalizations as well as to get guidance on, on what's redundant and what's not, just to reiterate what you were saying. Um, but at the same time, there are assays and methods that we could get started now on setting up a framework to, to go genome-wide, right, with the idea that that the experience from the 1% will feed into that, right? And again, setting kind of five year versus 10 year. So they're thing. not they're not necessarily at odds with one another. That, that, and they don't, that they don't necessarily have... need to be sequential. They could be right. in parallel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, so that was a, a big component of um, breakout five is that we could start with, uh, you know, readily accessible tissues from humans um, on scales of hundreds you know, the number 400 was put out there and using existing um, single cell technologies now and do single cell RNA-seq and attack-seq maybe even on the same cells and potentially develop new methods um, as those types of projects are going. So we didn't see them as mutually exclusive either. Yeah, here, Ali. <clears throat> Hi, Alan Morris, now VC or mine. So uh, I, I wanted to make two comments. One is I, I detected a certain amount of uh, stress around where we should focus on variants first or function first. And, and, and clearly there are people who want to get to, I want to understand my variant right now, you know, get me the fastest way to get to an answer to that variant. And there are people who are like, we want to understand how gene function works and, and we need to restrict the search space to, you know, a, a, a small number of cells, um, but I, I was going to say I, I think that there there is a there is a place for trying to do both, and at, some assays are better suited for one versus the other. We should sort of map that out. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing is I wanted to put a plug for for Christina's uh, trying to understand 
cell to cell communications. Mm -hmm. The idea of how the epigenome from one cell type is coordinating with the epigenome of another cell type that's interacting in the microenvironment. That seems to me like that's, a, that's actually a very challenging problem that gets to the beginning of how tissues interact. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're a little bit over influenced by how immunologists have approached this. Uh, it's, it's a great framework, but it may not be necessarily the one that works for all tissues and so on. So I missed that discussion, as did two-thirds of the audience. So what, 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 what was talked about in terms of what system could be used for that or what approaches? Basically, it, is this on? It, it wasn't discussed. It was put, uh, you know, on the slide that um, one thing that is missing is understanding communities of cells, how they interact. We have single-cell technologies for sort of phenotypically characterizing the communities and maybe their proportions change, but really understanding interactions and how they're mediated by genes and regulatory elements and variants, we have no models, right? So, so that was just a challenge to put out there, but it, you know, it's far away, perhaps. Does anybody want to take up the challenge? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> right. Maybe Aviv. Just to say I don't have a solution, but I think for the cell-cell interactions, um, getting imaging data, uh, from in vivo is going to be tremendously helpful. It will not solve the whole problem, but it would least lead to phenotypes that are at the level at which the question is being asked. Because you would be able to see genetic changes, gene the relations, sorry, the relation between the genetic variation and phenotypes that involve more than a single type of cell in the context in which they act. You, you mean at observing a single locus in, in terms of a readout, or many, or how, what, what's missing in terms I, I of... I think you would do it in a QTL setting, mm -hmm. and your quantitative trait will be features of the tissue. Mm -hmm. So you would look across multiple individuals, you would look, uh, and those individuals will be genotyped, and you would look at how these genotypes lead to different organization of cells relative to each other. So in some derived... So it becomes induced, some derived. Induced, induced primary cells. So you could, do do it, you could do it in culture or organoids, in which case it's a derived setting that you control, or you can do it in humans. Mm -hmm. maybe, so, okay. how, can we go to how, maybe Howard? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Howard Jacob from AVI. So uh, I'm, I'm going to try to frame this maybe a little bit differently. So there's a lot of competing ideas that are really good ideas, um, but if we start from my perspective, from the high level, what Hugo started off with this morning, where there's a lot of genes that we don't know what they do. So if we could do number one as a goal, to have 90% of all genes have some level of phenotype done in the next five to 10 years. Level two would be pick a number, whether it's 5%, 10%, 1%, that we know variation, as was also discussed this morning, at very detailed levels in medically relevant genes that needs to be defined. And the third level then would be is to start looking at complexity and looking at the multiomics. And I think if we could do those three things, all the tools we're talking about falls into those three categories at some level or another. Whether you're a human geneticist interested in rare disease, you can use uh, that strategy to help identify gene function. You can always also drill down into the into the um, to the medical side of it. But I think we have to have some framework around all these different ideas of, of what we're going to finish with. And I, I have to say that I think the biggest gap we have is we don't know what most of the genes do. And without that, it makes it really hard to know how to link the other pieces right. together. Right. So now I'm going to put my Elise hat on and say, why is that NHGRI's, you know, concern? That is, the knockout projects are going on as kind of a, is that a common fund project or is that an NHGRI project? I mean, how do you, how do you get at that? What are we not doing? I, it was a beautiful talk this morning um, about trying to define function across many systems. But what, what's not being done that Hugo, you know, didn't describe? And he said it was hard, right? So how do we, how do we get over that, that hurdle to get function? I, I think Hugo uh, wants to answer Oh, question. I didn't oh. see. I didn't <laughs> see. Where, yeah, Hugo, Hugo. So if we don't do this systematically, uh, and support the systematic knockdown. And it is being supported for some species, right? And that information gives us, at least from an evolutionary perspective, the function of the protein. When you're a cancer biologist and you find a gene that is in the wingless pathway, you immediately understand what you have to do and where you have to go. Because so many genes are unknown. When we find these new genes, we have no idea what 
what to expect, what pathway to look at. And so get, having that information provides a linchpin for other experiments in human cells. And so we need to do it in flies, we need to do it in worms, we need to do it in mice, we need to do it in zebrafish because there's some differences between them. But that allows you to really move fast forward with many of the human genes for which, as you know, 70, 80% of them have not been associated with the human disease. How can you study the genome and the sequences between the <coughs> genes in the genome if you don't even know what they impinge on? Yeah, so the, I think there are, yeast, there are some yeast biologists here that will tell you that you know, we don't understand Saccharomyces sacri sacri gene function. So what's the, what's the trick that you're going to use to understand function well, of? Well, we need, we develop, we have about 22, 23 different assays for every gene, viable or lethal, and we just need to do high throughput mm -hmm. phenotyping systematically mm -hmm. to get at function. Oh, maybe we'll go to this side. I'm ignoring this side. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Daniel? Oh, I mean, I guess. Yeah, Dan, maybe. One, one point to make is that over the next five years, an opportunity we'll have that we haven't had previously is the opportunity to do genome-first approaches. So, you know, genotype-guided recontact studies and then looking at uh, the phenotypes of individuals with very extreme genotypes. And that is fundamentally, I think, an NHGRI project in the sense that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't focus on any one phenotype. It necessarily says, let's look, for instance, at human knockouts across as many genes as we can find and then, and then explore each of those and figure out exactly what the phenotypes are that they perturb without necessarily going in with a strong hypothesis about which system we're looking at. And so I think that, that approach, which will be very powerful, will be something we haven't been able to do before, really does feel like an NHGRI focus, not another IC. Now yeah, we're back here. Uh, <clears throat> I would just make the point that, uh, to add on to what Hugo said, is that one reason NHGRI might want to support the kinds of things that Hugo is doing is because there, there are a set of uh, skills that are acquired by a center whose job is to understand function for human phenotypes by studying model organisms as opposed to labs that do it on a one-off basis. So the idea of developing 20, um, let's say, challenges that might bring out phenotypes that a lab that does it only occasionally would not have that built in. So I think it's important to have those kinds of centers for function. Sean. Try and again, actually, to ask, answer that question, uh, I, I think the key problem here is uh, uh, we're, uh, we need a sort of a, um, um, ways to assay the phenotype in, in, a, in a readily available way. I'm just sp speaking about myself. There's several hundred RNA modification enzymes out there. How are we going to assign function? Well, there's a mass spec. We can isolate the each individual RNA species. We can easily develop a high throughput quantitative way and we knock down each one of those enzymes and we, we examine every single RNA species to see which modification change, right? So I think I'm just speaking about myself. I'm sure there are communities working on other proteins that could come up with similar assays. This is probably something <coughs> HGRA can sort of uh, help facilitate the develop. Instead of doing this in lab individually, we can sort of have a more con uh, consorted effort. I, I think Jay actually mentioned something like that of, for profiling and the knockouts of transcripts. Been Richard, yeah, been um, patient. The, the menu of um, molecular and cellular assays and surrogate assays isn't so great, in my view. Uh, and I think we're giving a small T to technical development and in the tension between technical development and generating more data, we might want to think about more uh, resource into improving those methods ahead of some of the uh, data collection proposals. Mm -hmm. So it may maybe get more specific about you in terms of the the reproducibility, the utility of the assay. What well, it just a simple problem of missense variance in proteins. You pretty much now either look to um, some assay that's vaguely related to what you think the protein's function is. Or um, protein folding, perhaps, you know, or perturbation of that with a fluorescent couple or something like that. There's got to be other things in those spaces that are more generalizable than mm -hmm. building up a full model, you know, a complete model in multicellular or even organism that, um, that, that speak to the basic protein function that you can begin to screen. There's vast numbers of variants we just know nothing about. So you're arguing for new, 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 new assay technology, basically, that will interrogate other things that we, we don't yeah, have I yet Yeah, I think that's the kind of thing that Jay's 
lab's done with the, you know, the breast cancer gene are just the tip of the iceberg in mm -hmm. terms of both the technical, um, you know, the breadth of the menu and the impact that's going to have. I mean, hopefully in five years, we'll just be looking up the tables of all these kind of surrogate assays for mm -hmm. probabilistic views of what we think the, the variation we see actually means. So, so Richard, if I could, I want to make sure I'm following that, because it's, it, it's, it's not like you, you're maybe uh, asking for a, uh, a, a program seeking new technologies, and that reminds me of during the, uh, the sequencing projects, there were, there was an ongoing project for developing new, new sequencing technologies. And, and maybe uh, that, uh, and, and it was very uh, yeah, successful. And, and it was a, a constant yeah. struggle at meetings like this yeah. to keep the sequencing technology development alive. So <laughs> I think we've got to beat that drum. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Jay, you had a, just to, I mean, to paraphrase, or I think what you're, like generic scalable assays, right? Not necessarily all cellular, but, but there's clearly more room for that. And, and I think like Richard's saying, it's clearly, we're, if we just stick with RNA and chromatin, we're probably not doing ourselves a favor relative to the full menu of things that are probably within reach. Right. I'm looking for assistant professors. Yeah, here, Amy. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Stephanie Hicks from Johns Hopkins. So I really appreciated the discussion today about generating multimodal data, scalable assays. Um, but I think something that hasn't been discussed or something that I would like to see the NHGRI support more of um, is the computational statistical methods that are used to, for the, the processing, the normalization, the integration of this data, not only for integrating just across the different types of omics, but also the, um, the non-molecular assays, so electronic healthcare records, imaging data, that's a non-trivial problem, and I would really like to see um, this group support projects like that. And also things like, that you might think a statistician or a data scientist or a bioinformatician that just does this, such as if your data gets so large, you can't load it into your memory on your computer, what do you do? You have to resort to using on-disk memory representations such as HDF5 files or parallelization. You have to implement the algorithms such that they can take advantage of these um, tools to make those analyses scalable uh, or just moving to the cloud, for example. Um, but it's not just a sufficient to just move to the cloud. You also have to uh, teach and educate, I find, researchers and faculty and students on how to use that and, for example, how to budget for computations in the cloud and things like that. Thank, Thank you. you. I see Mark. Maybe you want to comment on this? Sure. Uh, sure. I'd just like to amplify that last uh, comment, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I think we've heard a lot about interesting uh, data sets to generate in the future, but I think that it's, first of all, it's going to be really important to think about how all these are going to be fused together and what form that model is going to be and how we're going to interpret it. And that's a very non-trivial thing that, you know, I think requires a lot of thought and support. And second of all, one thing that was uh, discussed in the breakout room that we were in is that, you know, just simply doing computes on really large amounts of potentially private data is going to be a huge challenge. And we have to think about how to build a national computational infrastructure to handle that. I mean, it's not going to happen on your desktop computer. It's going to have to happen on something very substantive. And, and, and NHGRI should really lead the way in developing platforms for this type of large-scale compute. You know, I've heard that in several different uh, breakouts about yeah. that surprisingly, shockingly, that, you, that the data that exists hasn't really been aggregated properly. And this is more of a computational issue than, you know, I, yes, I mean, there is a role, obviously, for sequencing within an HGRI. I think they'll continue. But there's a lot of other sequencing, and maybe an HGRI could lead the way on aggregating. I know Dan has his hand up there. I guess, I guess just one point. I think most people in the room understand it, but it's, it's definitely not just a technical challenge. There's also very substantial policy uh, issues and regulatory issues associated mm -hmm. with aggregating that data mm -hmm. overall. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I'll, I'll raise it again. People have heard me say it before, but mm -hmm. just want to make sure people know that. Okay. Um, Andy. So another issue relating to uh, yeah, statistics and computation is many of the measurements that we're talking about for a function are, are going to be quantitative. Mm -hmm. And as such, that means they're all measured with error. And so having a very clear sense that we need to uh, quantify and understand what are the sources of that error, 
Um, and those issues need to go into the, to, the, to the design of the experiment. Mm -hmm. So this sort of separation of, oh, we'll do all these uh, experiments to get it function, and then separately we'll model them is absolutely the wrong <laughs> way right. that we need to bring in the statisticians to think about the design given the error structure. Yeah, of these yeah this came up, I know, in the breakout right. six that, yeah. you know, I, it, it's a challenge to coordinate, and I was on NHGRI Council, it, projects get launched. It's a challenge to coordinate things where you have input in the very beginning. We're deciding, oh, the GTEx samples should be used in you know, this high throughput assays. They should be consented. There's an NTEx that was started that, 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 that with, the, with consented samples, et cetera. So I think part of this is experimental design, as I mentioned, or, and, and input right from the very beginning. And maybe some of the projects that are launched out of these kinds of discussions could be coordinated in that way, although you know the budgetary issues make you have to launch things at slightly different times. Right. But I, you know, I think that's a it's a very very important point because some of the assays still no, aren't maybe robust enough, as Rich was saying, you know, to know, you know, you know, can you quantify this, you know, degradation of an RNA or something over time well enough to know that that's going to give you the the, the variant that is actually going to be able to be measured in that assay. And, and so one of the points that I've heard come up um, yeah, indirectly related to this is, is batch effects across different experiments. And so as the data sets get much larger and you're going to want to start integrating data sets that were perhaps generated in different labs for the same project or across different projects, it's going to become more complicated. And so perhaps what we could do is have a reference set of samples, which has been done before and, and, and allowed for um, you know, modeling of what the batch effects in any given experimental setting might be. So yeah, I think that's a good point. In, in some of the ENCODE projects, there was a, you know, everybody did H1 or something with different assays and then compared results. That, hey, Eric Zaden, Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I wanted to amplify all the things that have been said about making the data do more work uh, by Stephanie and, and, and Mark and others. Um, I also wanted to just throw another word in that mix, which is data visualization. I think we've talked a lot about statistics. I think visualization is at least as important. Um, and I think it needs to be taken really, really seriously in any of these large scale projects. And I think it needs to be taken seriously sort of from day one, rather than as something you try to sort of paste on at the end. Yeah, Hugo mentioned that in his talk about being, making it accessible so that the, you, the interpretability, all the data is there, and then you present that in a way. And that's, you know, I think people don't get really a lot of credit for that. I mean, you don't, there's a lot of other things they don't get credit for, but <laughs> I think, right. but, but designing something that is extremely usable, it'll be adopted, obviously. Things yeah. that work but get that adopted. John? I, I think it's worth to echo Andy's point uh, about the error, and, and really, it seems to me that, that NHGRI has not just been generate or focused on generation of data, but rather focus on generation of gold standard reference data. That's the sweet spot that NHGRI has had, whether it's the human genome, whether it's in code, et cetera. That focus on quality is what has distinguished a lot of these efforts and what has made them so incredibly useful. And I think that that's a very uh, important line um, that, that ties together a number of thoughts here. And, and I, along those lines, I think it's just in general, it's worth it to make a very, have a very clear eyed view of where things currently stand so that we don't make unrealistic expectations about where things are going to be in five years. I mean, it, looking at, say, doing saturation screens of genes, I mean, the number of, we're not even in the case of the low-hanging fruit, it's not even the fruit on the ground, this is the apple in your mouth on which all you have to do is close your teeth and, and take a bite, because in, in, terms, in, terms, of using, uh, in terms of using selection uh, and survival as a phenotype. I mean, there's a very limited space there. And, and again, on the data visualization point, it's a shocking thing that here we are in 2019, you cannot go to a genome browser and crack open in one shot and just look at, for example, all of the ENCODE data. It just doesn't exist. So there are, there are enormous challenges that are, that are out there in front of us. Uh, it's just really good to know exactly where we stand. So what, that's a very good point, John. Why, why hasn't that happened? What, what has been the limitation? Where is the gap in, in uh, either technology or funding or what? 
right, to be able to, to make more accessible the data that already exists. Yeah. I just wanted to respond to that. I mean, I think, you know, there's really simple things. I mean, simple things about like the particular policies used by particular web servers, the settings on particular web servers. This is the kind of thing where literally, if you've just got 10 people into the room, you know, at the cost of a bunch of plane tickets, you could significantly accelerate the development of data visualization uh, for the entire yeah. community. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think- So you're it, gonna organize that, that workshop, right? Good, so <laughs> you guys. Well, and, and uh, it sounds like a great idea. If it's solvable, that's something that low, it's sort of apple in the mouth already, bite and finish this. But, but the, the, there are a lot of threads to this. And, and uh, so uh, if, if uh, a user could go to a gene of interest and open up, quote, all the encode, there are 10,000 tracks to look at. Right? So uh, it, it's screaming out that you need dimensional reduction, but dimensional reduction <coughs> needs to be done in an ordered and a way that uh, a way that is really designed to try to bring out the best information. So that, that uh, you maybe could imagine some kind of uh, summary representation, and, and, and many of you in the audience are much better at this than I am, that when you don't see that the traditional tracks, but you're getting, um, uh, I don't know, so, some glowing light at the thing that you really want. I mean, so, so, some really hot color or, or whatever. And, and uh, but it's, it, my limitations of being able to come up with the, the, the best uh, uh, visualization, just as an illustration of, well, such a workshop could be really, really valuable. You know, get people to really know what that they're doing and to, to, to try to get the most informative representations. And, and it doesn't have to be the traditional ones, but the ones that communicate best. Trey. Yeah, just to chime in on Erez's point, I mean, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, lower this activity to, oh, we'll just, we'll just solve it in one workshop. I mean, although I appreciate, you know, the, the efforts to organize such a thing. But, but I, I mean, this is, this, I mean, big data are not a big idea by themselves, right? There's a lot of discussion in the last hour on, you know, here's my big idea defined by what data set I'm going to generate or not. But, you know, this is an example, I would argue, of an equally big idea or, you know, needs mm. to be matured into such. That, that is a capability that we would like to have by 2025 or whatever that we don't have right now. And so, so you know, efforts to articulate that and, and, and plan for that would be great. And, and it's, it's gonna be more than a workshop, I think. I think Eric uh, wanted to follow up on, you just kind of started this, I, did you? I mean, I'm happy to organize such a <laughs> workshop, please. <laughs> You know, let me know if uh, if you'd like to come. I do. I, I completely agree that this is something that needs uh, really durable support that's organically built into every effort um, uh, on NHGRI's part. But I also think that it's the case that um, some of some of the types of things that are happening with NHGRI data are um, it's just very very far behind the eight ball in terms of where the field is. To the point that yes, a small number of people could actually you know, do, do a fair bit um, if we had the right people in the room. And I think the National Library of Medicine should actually be involved in, in a lot of this sort of stuff. Because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so there are uh, several. Maybe in, in oh. your name. Oh, Eric Jarvis. Yeah, there were several points made, uh, you know, one of them being about, you know, putting all the encode to data together. But also I think the very first point uh, where NHGRI really has a, a niche is that a more complete reference end-to-end -end, uh, genomes and other types of data sets. Uh, partly the reason why is that uh, the more draft-like, let's call them, uh, data out there are cheaper. And that's gonna drive uh, the economy in that direction. It's gonna drive lots of scientists in that direction. And those scientists don't have the money to invest in uh, the high-quality uh, genome generation uh, or the technology for it as well but NHGRI does. And so, um, so I, don't, I think without that support, maybe some other country will do it, but I don't think it's gonna be an investigator in the United States doing it alone. Does anybody wanna comment on that point? I, I do. I, I always say there is no epigenome without the genome, okay? A lot of the interesting <laughs> epigenetic variation that you see exists on sequences that are particularly challenging to 
to sequence now, transposons, et cetera. I know Ting had his hand up over here. Um, I know they don't evolutionarily conserve, but yet they, they have some biochemical activity acting as regulatory elements, et cetera. And we see that in our data and we say, yeah, we need, we need, we need real genomes and NHGRI can't believe wouldn't continue to, to really push that technology because that's the home of the genome. I think Ting actually wanted to say Yes, Ting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I do want to chime in on the data visualization point. Uh, this is not about transposable element, but I'm going to lead back to the transposable <laughs> element. Uh, You'll the circle end. back to that. <laughs> right. So, so I agree completely with uh, what Aris uh, uh, mentioned. You know, data visualization is indeed a pretty uh, big uh, deal in the context of what uh, NHGRI uh, is uh, going to uh, achieve over the next decade. Uh, but I, I do, uh, um, you know, uh, want us to appreciate that this is not just like ten investigators, you know, can solve the problem. It, it, it connects multiple problems. I mean, it connects to data access, you know, how to access data. That's mm -hmm. a problem on its own. It, uh, it, uh, it involves data management, right? Not just the storage of the data, where we put the data so that, you know, different uh, visualization engines can go access, but also it involves how to manage this data, right? Data infrastructure has been evolving. How are we going to deal with the new data we're going to generate? How are we going to, uh, how are we going to uh, make the infrastructure compatible to, so that the old data that we generated in the past right. decade can be. Right, what I want is, right? Alexa, show me ankle two in <laughs> zebrafish, you know, worms right. and flies. And then it appears on my desktop. And, and then the third area is actually visualization itself. It requires a different set of ex expertise to you know, when you think about your data, what's the best way to visualize it? For example, you know, everybody's dealing with single cell data now. How to put single cell data on a mm -hmm. genome browser? I don't think anyone has a real solution for that problem. So I, I think we need, you know, a different set of expertise to, to tackle that kind of visualization problem. You know, protein-protein interaction, how to put it on a genome browser, right? So that, that, that's real challenges uh, out there in the field. Going back to transposable element, right? How do you visualize we, in a sense, transposable element-centric way? So I do feel that this is a conversation, this is a workshop among, you know, uh, a data producer, a data scientist who work on, you know, uh, infrastructures, and real biologists who knows how they want their data to be engaged, and, you know, how, how they want to explore the data, and the engineers who actually code it up, you know, to, to come up with uh, visual solutions to, right. to this problem. Yeah, I, I've been hearing about the Google Earth for the genome for a long right. time. I haven't seen it yet. Maybe we need to get well, the Google guys by, by the way, you, you can. You can access all the ENCODE roadmap data uh -huh. from what's your IP genome uh -huh. browser. Okay. But yeah, there are, there are you know, 50,000 tracks for you mm -hmm. to, uh, to actually 80,000 tracks now for you to choose from. I, I'm looking at, at, at assistant over here. Ryan Layer from uh, Boulder. So I think that visualization is part of the problem or part of the solution, but uh, discovery is also, I mean, there's an enormous amount of data available to us. We're talking about generating even more, and it's quite daunting for a new investigator to integrate a new data set or even an old data set into their, into their project if they have no idea what all the cell lines are, what all of the experiments are. There's, there's latent discoveries in the data we have just because you can't explore or search the data. So visualization is great, but how do I even know to make that connection? It'd be, it'd be this idea of Google is a, is a good one or of Alexa, but, but how do I know even to look in this one spot, in this one directory, on this one S3 drive? Alexa, show me interesting data. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, I, AI. Show me something that's like yeah. what I've already seen. Mark. I just want to amplify again on this conversation. Um, one word that I just want to put into the discussion is data product. I mean, I think that we should think of a lot of these collective data sets as a product from NHGRI and how do we put that out in the best way and, you know, get it used. And I think that really requires a lot of uh, leadership by NHGRI. It's not just making a lot of data, it's kind of putting it together. Uh, and one other thing I want to point out that was discussed in the room that I was in that hasn't been brought up very much here is, I think it's kind of interesting also how we integrate the genome with non-genomic data. I mean, this was brought up a little bit. There was a lot of enthusiasm, and I think a lot of people don't know how to do that, and I think we should kind of, you know, show them how. Yeah. Here, question. Um, 
Judy, Judy Cho, Mount Sinai, New York. So um, I wanted to amplify and change the topic a bit, uh, amplify what Daniel MacArthur alluded to, uh, which is kind of the human knockout efforts. I mean, if with all the sequencing going on and us knowing, not knowing the functions of most of the genes and humans are gonna be most deeply phenotyped and um, if you've lived long enough to get your DNA drawn, uh, that's important information and then standards so that as we start identifying all of these loss of function variants and living, breathing human beings, uh, can NHGRI play a lead role in defining how you're going to phenotype the human knockouts? So there's no, I'm just trying to think, I'm not aware of all NHGRI projects, but there's no systematic analysis project of human knock, I mean, this is epistasis or, epi, you know, What's the, what's, what's the current, st there, yeah. There is no, no systematic project currently underway to identify and characterize them. Obviously it's happening in phenotype specific areas, but the idea of doing a genome wide search, I think we have a pretty good handle on how you might approach it, targeting consanguineous populations, bottlenecked populations, populations where we have the ability to do genotype guided recontact, where there's already some existing phenotype data. The, the, the plans are there, but we don't currently have a, a specific strategy for getting that done. And one other point about phenotyping is it's not just kind of understanding the gene function, but it also provides valuable drug targeting safety information. So again, a systematic effort in this area I think might be fruitful. Yeah, Julie. To, to kind of continue on that, in addition to the um, rare, typically rare loss of function carriers, there is also the TWAS predict scan type of um, approaches where you have a genetic prediction of individuals that are that have a particularly low, <coughs> low or high expression level or, or, an, or a different splicing pattern of a given gene. And one can also kind of look at, look at the phenotypes of those individuals similarly to what Nancy has been doing. Yeah. I'll just add a, a last point on that. This actually dovetails a lot with an emphasis on recruiting diversity uh, mm -hmm. through NHGRI GRI mechanisms because many of the populations in the Americas, Hispanic Latino populations, are actually vendor populations and really neatly tie into these efforts. Right, I think, I don't know, was it Eric mentioned this, you know, continuing role for, you know, unique populations of, for NHGRI sequencing that, yeah, there's a lot of sequence out there, not necessarily focused on a biological question. Other comments? So we have a few minutes left. Um, Sharon, Sharon had a question. Oh, well, Sharon, I, Sharon, hi. I was just going to say, with regard to the question about systematic phenotyping, to a certain extent, it still is very disease dependent, but you could look at the UDN as an example where they do have a relatively systematic way in which patients with particular complaints are evaluated that if you wanted to look at patients with loss of function alleles, and I would really encourage people to not use the knockout human term. I think it is not well received by the public. Um, and don't laugh. The laughing is really the whole problem. I'm just saying that this we is the kind We call them knockouts in Arabidopsis, but I, we do I appreciate in, your in sensitivity. We do in model organisms, but it's the kind of thing where science is viewed very poorly when we use mm -hmm. that kind of terminology. Anyway, for individuals who have biallelic loss of function variants in genes, you could certainly propose to use a UDN-like systematic phenotype as just one example. We, we do have a few more minutes. Um, so a lot of interesting ideas. Um, it, one, one issue here is that, um, Alexa tripled the NHGRI budget to, because <laughs> we've got a lot of ideas. And, I think we're going to go into some synthesis and priorities, et cetera, at some point. But you know, keep that in mind in terms of your favorite. You know, how you know within the realm of how many dollars exist, what would be your community's priorities? Right, that's what we're trying to, to get from from these folks. Eric, Joe, this is just a, a random idea, or not really idea, thought from the last day and a half. We seem to have gotten ourselves in a conundrum where. Historically, in some ways, the phenotyping was way ahead of sequencing. And now in 2019, looking forward to the next few years, the sequencing is going to be way ahead of the phenotyping. But the, inst the, the way the NIH is organized, there really isn't a place that stands up and takes responsibility for seeing that those special individuals, however we want, or cells, however we want to define it, actually gets phenotyped. Right. 
And, and, and I wonder, and, and maybe this isn't the place to have the discussion, but it does seem like a desperate need for us to pull things together across institutes and figure out how we can get these special cells, organelle, organelles, and people very deeply phenotyped, if yeah. that's what we're calling for. Sounds like a, a common fund project headed by NHGRI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we've used the word common, you know, it's, it's like we've, we've sucked the common fund dry here over the last day and a half. And so we need to figure out how we're going to pull funds together um, across the institutes, maybe separate from the common fund. Question. Uh, Marilyn Ritchie, University of Pennsylvania. I want to spin off of what Eric just said and bring back something Nancy said yesterday about pleiotropy and how this institute, unlike all of the others, does have the ability to look across phenotypes. And I think we know that there are a lot of genes that are associated and, and correlated with traits that are from very different organ systems and kind of different um, disease areas, which would be studied by different institutes. And, and yet a lot of symptoms, if you look at complex traits, a lot of them have overlapping symptoms that if you drill down might be due to similar genetics. And so I think if there's a way kind of in the space of this deep phenotyping to think about the across phenotypes and, and remember that pleiotropy, which also ties with epistasis, I think that kind of making sure we emphasize that is going to be important. So phenotyping centers, is that? Is that one thing that people are thinking about? We're focused on disease variants, I mean, of the kind that we heard earlier? Okay, I think we're. And so, Joe, just yeah. to change slightly okay. here, but something that I've heard um, brought up in many different contexts is really the need to uh, have technology developed that can actually synthesize long synthetic DNA segments. And it, the, in, in several of the conversations, individuals were like, it's completely unclear why that hasn't proceeded. And so is it, I mean, I don't think we need to get into the details here, but is it something that we com need to come up with a completely novel revolutionary idea in order to achieve this? Or is this something that can incrementally be done? Do you have, some must be some experts on synthesis in the audience, no? I mean, there are, there are interesting avenues that people are pursuing of like non-templated, you know, like terminal transfers, things like that. Um, not so accurate at this point, but hey, Jay, you, you're, you're, you're looking I was looking me. around for Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't know where he went. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I mean, it's. Oh, Jeff. I'm here. Hey. Uh, if I can just say, Jeff, Jeff posted some amazing preprints just like in the last couple of days. Okay, tell that us. Are right Summarize. on these topics. <laughs> tell us the abstract. Well, uh, so what we've been doing is we've been making very long DNA molecules from starting materials that are uh, either amplicons or commercially synthesized. I think where the pain point is for most people, though, is in the three to five to 10 KB range, because that's what people know how to do things with today. And it's still uh, painfully expensive. And we're looking for, I think we're looking for new technologies that can reduce cost per base by an order of magnitude, as well as uh, increasing the length. And I just think it hasn't been a priority for, uh, it hasn't been a priority for NHGRI and maybe it should be, uh, to invest specifically in technology development uh, in that arena. So I don't know why it's so difficult. We haven't you know, focused on it ourselves because we can do what we need to do with today's technology, but we want to see those drops of mm -hmm. 10 to 100 to 1,000 fold in cost. We're actually, we're actually faced with this because we need to modify each gene in Drosophila and bring in yeah. through CRISPR these large constructs. And so we have now relatively cheap ways of doing this for constructs up to 2 kb. And so with 2 kb, we currently pay to modify with CRISPR about $300 a piece. And it's still expensive, but it's within the realm for most people to, to work with. And so we do this now systematically. Great. Thank you. I'm going to have to wrap it up because I'm getting a hook here from Elise. So <laughs> thank you very much for contributing to the conversation.
I, th I think that's been a very exciting uh, discussion. Thank you very much. We're going to take a 15-minute break now, and then we're going to reconvene for some more uh, focused discussions uh, that I think are going to extend on some of the things we've already been, been talking about, um, and then we'll move into the topic-specific sessions. So please be back in 15 minutes. <laughs>